Life is the greatest gift that we can ever receive in our entire existence. Now, when we receive a gift, usually we are very curious. We open the box and we look to see what's in it. But during the years, I have noticed that us, the grown-ups, have a very strange behavior. It is the greatest gift of all, the gift of life, the one that we put away and don't have the courage to look inside for almost our entire existence. And I say almost because when we are very little, we have this courage. We have this brave heart of trying anything, of aspiring to become anything. But during the years, we cease to believe that we have received something special. We put this gift away and let tons of dust get over it. And today I have a confession to make. I've made the same thing, throwing away the gift of life, for almost 30 years. I was too busy working, I was too busy studying, I was too busy working and studying, until life had started to take away many of the gifts she offered. I lost my job, I lost all the money that I've made working in that many extra hours. I almost lost my life in a car accident. But above all, I have lost my mother. She was diagnosed with cancer, and in just one month, she was no longer here. I then understood that I've missed a lot of important lessons. The lesson of happiness, the lesson of love, the lesson of friendship, of free time, most of all, the lesson of who I was and what is my purpose on this earth. And because there were too many lessons, I said, OK, let's go back to school again. We have to stop this. And I did. I went back to school again. And it's a very similar school to what happens here today. It was a school with teachers, with presentation, with speakers. And uh, it was actually a four, day, four, four days boot camp that literally changed my mind and my life. Because they say that when the student is really ready, the teacher appears. And it seemed that I was ready because the teacher appeared. He's one of the most famous speakers in Romania. But I didn't knew that at that time. I was completely unaware of this. And Andy Seke, because this is his name, he ended his marvelous talk at that event, saying the following things. When you feel that you have come at the end of all the light that it is in you, and you are ready to take that first step in the darkness of the unknown, you can be sure that just one of the two things can happen. You will either find a very solid ground to put your steps upon, or you will be taught to fly. And that completely changed my perspective about everything and anything. And I started to believe again in all the dreams that I had when I was a little girl. And I remembered about that dream about being above, about flying. And I understood that, that um, life is offering always opportunities to live big, but we don't see it because we don't believe in them. And uh, when you start to believe in things, all the th signs start to appear. And the signs appeared. Three years ago, I was uh, on my way to pick up some friends from the airport. Uh, they, were coming back for, um, they were coming back from an expedition to Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in the world outside, uh, outside the Himalayas. And I was surprised of something very strange. None of them reached the summit, but they all looked transformed and different in a way that made me very, very curious. The second sign was uh, the fact that in the same day, I read a book called Into Thin Air, which is, uh, the, movie that, uh, which is the book that Movie Everest is based on. And not long after that, I got got the chance to meet Alex Gavan and spend some hours with him. Alex Gavan is one of the most famous and uh, experienced climbers in Romania. And there were three signs, too many, to not 
acknowledge the fact that maybe high mountains are calling me. And, and I understood right, because in one month after that, one of the friends from Aconcagua proposed something very courageous to me, to climb to Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc is one of the most uh, famous mountains in Western Europe. It has almost 5,000 meters, and it's, okay, it's nothing special about it, but that was special about it was the fact that I never climbed any mountain before. I haven't reached any summit until that moment, not even here in Romania. But I said yes. I had uh, three months of preparation ahead of me, a lot of time. And uh, I went there. It was uh, the first day of the expedition. It was a very rainy, cold and foggy day. We started our ascent and I was wearing uh, 30 kilos of luggages. I weighed 40, uh, I, I weighed there 40, and I weighed, I weighed today 40, and uh, it was in, I was incredibly slow, incredibly slow. The 10 people group separated in two, seven were ahead, and three of us with a weaker condition were left behind. It soon got dark because we started very late, as I told you, it was around three in the afternoon, and uh, we were alone. We felt lost and abandoned on the mountain. Nobody turned to see what are we doing there. And then I understood that in the most important journeys of our lives, we are completely alone. I stood awake all night trying to put all my mental power back together because I realized then that there is no chance in the world that I would climb that mountain with my body, so I have to climb it with my mind. And so I did. In the day of the summit, uh, we left very early, and um, I saw my expedition mates descending one by one without reaching the summit and uh, deciding to b go back. And our guide decided the same. And basically, the one who left, the ones who left us, were summiting by ourselves. We were six people who made the summit. I was the second one. And for me, Mont Blanc remains until today um, a very painful lesson of what human nature can turn into when it's not that easy anymore, when it's come at the edge of surviving. But I didn't lose hope that an expedition can look differently. And in 2015, the next year in August, I left for Kilimanjaro, I, uh, it, this is a mountain in uh, Africa, the highest standing, freestanding mountain in the world. It's almost 6,000 meters uh, high, and it was a completely different experience. I had incredible colleagues, one Romanian girl and two guys from Germany, an amazing guy, uh, really it helped us a lot, he helped us a lot, and uh, 15 other people who were porters, cooks, and second guide who supported uh, us all the way and made an incredible journey for every single one of us. We took the Machame route, which is uh, known as uh, the whiskey route because it's tough. It's 62 kilometers long. It took us six days to get it. And uh, on the day of the summit, I could almost feel my body because it was something very strange. I could only feel the upper side of the body, but somehow the feet continued to go on further. And I have managed to reach the summit on a beautiful day around 11 o'clock together with my Romanian uh, mate, the Germans. Uh, were very organized and decided to leave earlier, as uh, always in, we know about them this. And uh, until today, Kilimanjaro remains a lesson of very, uh, of, of, of kindness, of living in the present moment, and the great contrast between what poverty means from the material point of view, but what richness means from the spiritual point of view and the greatness of the card. The next year, the last year, actually, in 2060, uh, I decided to uh, stay on our continent and to try to summit Mount Elbrus, which is the one, uh, which is the mountain uh, with the highest, uh, the highest mountain in, in Europe. And uh, this was the, the most amazing experience that I've ever had regarding teamwork. We were nine people and we had a common goal, to stay together, to stand up for each other, and to be united as long as it takes. 
And so we did. We reached 100% our uh, objective. Everyone reached the summit. And until today, Elbrus remains for me a lesson of what friendship may bring alone when we put all the forces together and to strive for a common goal. After three years of waiting, after three years of dreaming, this year I have finally reached to the mountain that uh, aroused my curiosity and inflamed my passion and my, uh, my goal of uh, seeing life from a different perspective. Aconcagua. Aconcagua has uh, almost 7,000 meters. It is, as I told you before, the highest mountain in the world outside the Himalayas. And uh, for me, it was so far the toughest expedition. And uh, the reasons are many. It's, uh, it's a long expedition. It took us three weeks in total. Uh, the acclimatization, I mean, putting your body ready to do it, to, to, to be ready for that thin air from above, took us two weeks of acclimatization. You have to bring your luggage all the time. You have to make double care. You bring half of your luggage to the next time, uh, to the next camp, then you decide. And the next day, you bring the rest and uh, go, go up again. It's an up and down expedition, and such life is most of the time. Another reason was uh, that we were 14 people team, and I was the only woman. And it was tough because I had to keep up all the time. But the most difficult day was the day of the summit, because we started very early in the morning. It was absolutely dark. You couldn't see anything. It was extremely cold, minus 30 degrees. And the wind was blowing with a, a lot of strength and power, and the speed was very high, 60 kilometers per hour. But we decided to go any, anyway. And my colleagues started to descend without reaching the summit which made me suffer a lot because we were together for a long time already and we became friends and it affects you in a way that you cannot imagine. But I stay strong and I was the last one. Every time I'm the last one when I'm climbing the mountain. And I reached the summit after 12 hours of climbing. When I am at the base of the mountain, I love the mountain. But when I'm at the top of him, I think that the mountain loves me. And uh, being on the top of Aconcagua at that moment meant that actually I was the highest standing person in the whole world because the Himalaya was closed at that moment. And it's a feeling of uh, greatness and of uh, humbles, humbling in the same time. It's very difficult to explain but it's a mix of different feelings, and it's, it's absolutely unbearable to describe in words. And with this feeling, I started to descend. Of course, the darkness arrived again. I was alone with one of the guides, and we got lost. It took us several hours to find the path back. And in total, I spent 20 hours to the summit and back. But until today, and for the rest of my life, Aconcagua will remain the lesson that when you have a big dream, this dream really deserves to stick on it and to give it as much time, as energy, as you can. Now I have to make another confession. I have a special situ situation. I was exempt from uh, sport hours in school. I am called most of the times. Um, I discovered ever since I was a girl that I am afraid of heights. And I know that I haven't chose uh, the easy way for me. And when you have a big dream, it's not important that you choose the easy way. It's important to choose the hard way. Today I'm uh, in the middle of this project. It is called Seven Summits. It involves reaching the highest summit on each continent. I'm almost half of the way. Uh, I have still four to go, and I hope uh, I will uh, find all the power to make it until the end. And I will continue also to support uh, children that 
uh, suffer from cancer because this is the cause that I have supported ever since I climbed Mont Blanc. And this is the cause that I have chosen in the memory of my mother, who was a teacher, and she worked with the students all of her life. Now I know that um, when it comes to what made you uh, go there, what gave you the force and so on, there's a lot you can say. But for me, it was only one thing, the courage, my brave heart. And I also know when I imagine that maybe not anyone wants uh, to climb high mountains. So I leave you in the end with a beautiful story that traveled around the world and impressed almost everybody who, who heard it. This is a story many years ago of an elementary school teacher called Mrs. Thompson. And she disliked one of our students in her class. Without knowing exactly the reason, that this Stoddard was always uh, clumsy, uh, his clothes were messy, he constantly needed a bath, and he paid no interest in school at, at all. But one day, the teacher read the school files of all, all her children, of her, all, all of her students, and including uh, the file of Teddy. And she could find out that uh, Teddy's mother suffered of a terminal illness, and when, she wa when, he was in, uh, when Teddy was in the third grade, she died. Mrs. Thompson then understood the problem, and she felt ashamed of herself. And she felt even worse when uh, children brought her Christmas presents, very colorful and uh, with shiny ribbons, except Teddy's. His, uh, his present was uh, wrapped in a brown paper, which he took from a grocery bag. And all the children started to laugh when they saw the present. It was a bracelet with some stones missing, and a bottle of perfume, which was almost empty. But the teacher stifled everyone when she put the bracelet on, exclaiming, what beautiful bracelet. And she was dabbing some, uh, some perfume in the air. Teddy, Teddy stood after hours long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mother used to. After Teddy left, the teacher cried for almost an hour. And from that day, she quit teaching children reading, writing, and arithmetic with her mind. And instead, she began to teach them with her heart. She paid a special attention to Teddy. And as long as she encouraged him, his mind seemed to come alive. And she became one of the best and smartest students in the class. During the years, she, he finished elementary school, he finished high school, he finished university, he took his master degree with highest of honors, and every time he wrote a letter to Mrs. Thompson, telling her that she was still the best teacher in the world for him. And in the last letter, Teddy mentioned that he met a girl, and he was going to be married. But he was also wondering if Mrs. Thompson would agree to come to the wedding and sit uh, at the place which is usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did. She came, and guess what? She was wearing that bracelet with some stones missing, and uh, she was sure to wear that perfume that reminded Teddy of his mother and their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Teddy whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Mrs. Thompson, I want to thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for make me, making me feel important and showing me that I can make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, told him, Teddy, you got it all wrong. You were the one who showed me that I can make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. And I told you this story because when it comes to educate, to innovate, I think the greatest teachers are the ones who are able to look deeply into their students' lives, to understand both their potential and their stories, and uh, to accept that in the end, there are no separations between teachers and students, that a teacher can become at any time a student, and a student can in any moment 
become a teacher, especially in the School of Life. But in the end, any teacher's work can be continued by ourselves, only by ourselves. And we become the greatest teachers for our lives. And the greatest lesson that we can learn is that life is worth living. There is never too late to remember that you have that special gift waiting for you, just to open it. It only takes a moment of awareness and a moment of trust in yourself and in what this life, beautiful life, has reserved for you. And you'll see that the only thing you need in order to live a very fully life is a very, very brave heart.